When I think of the life and witness and ministry of Thomas Cranmer, I think of three things. A commitment to scripture, a worship understanding that worship arises from the heart, and a commitment to sacrifice, even at the cost of his own life. In some ways, the scriptures are trying to get at those things. Of course, the prayer of Solomon in 1 Kings is, in essence, an allusion to the extraordinary revolution over which Thomas Cranmer presided with not just worship in the vernacular, but a very reformed understanding about the very nature of worship embodied at the beginning of the 1549 prayer book. Uh, a commitment to the centrality of scripture as a definer of how we worship and what is and is not permissible in worship that was considered not only revolutionary, but of course by Mary, who presided over his martyrdom, heretical. But it is something for which Anglicanism has been indebted ever since. Uh, there is, both in the 39 Articles as well as in their ordination rites, a central commitment to the Bible containing all things necessary to salvation, to quote the ordination services, to which we go back to again and again and again. In fact, it has been the gift of Anglicanism ever since to never require of any member in Anglicanism to believe in anything that cannot be directly proven by Scripture. Um, that's something that I must say that I continue to treasure, and that we have that ability to make a distinction, almost to put things in three categories, although it's very messy, and we're used to that as Anglicans do, that either it is directly proven by Scripture, or it is something about which Scripture has not spoken definitively. Therefore, we're willing to have live and let live around those things. And things that are in direct contrary, that are directly contrary to Scripture, for which we cannot, on the basis of our commitment to Scripture, support. That continues to be the bedrock of how we understand what we do and even why we worship, in fact, the way that we do. And it is particularly that place in the middle, uh, those things that cannot directly be either proven or disproven by Scripture, that obviously where we have the most controversy. Uh, but in fact, we're willing to live with the controversy because we don't want to require of anyone that which cannot be directly proven by Scripture. And that continues to flow in and through the life of the church. What holds that together, it seems to me, is something that, that Cranmer deeply treasured. And that was an understanding of a relationship with God that based on the redemption of Christ required both the engagement of the mind as well as the engagement of the heart. Um, Ashley Knoll's superb book called Thomas Cranmer's Doctrine of Repentance, which is basically a book version of his PhD uh, thesis, emphasizes again and again that the language of the heart that Cranmer introduced into liturgy had everything to do with that passionate commitment, underlined passionate, to this lively faith that in fact involved the heart. Hence, for example, the colic for purity. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. All hearts are open. And saying that literally at the beginning of the service, understanding that what we're not trying to do is hide from God, but rather be entirely open to Him because it is the death and resurrection of Jesus that makes that possible. We don't have to sort of put our best foot forward and hope he ignores the things about our life that we don't like. But instead we can be all of who we are in his presence, knowing that in his presence, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, there's cleansing, there is forgiveness, there is mercy, there is acceptance. Not acceptance of sin, but acceptance of the sinner. A very, very important distinction. And so, and out of that comes this commitment to sacrifice. You see, if I know that I am as a sinner, not as somebody who is faking it, but as a sinner who is committed to living a holy life, and accepted in all of my imperfections, 
then I can take great risks in life because I don't ever have to be afraid of jeopardizing my standing with God. In other words, to know that I am His means I can step out and try the unknown. I can do things that I would never have expected to do if my commitment was to a safe existence. Because I know that no matter wherever I am and whatever I do, nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it was, in fact, that which channeled, that caused Cranmer to, for me, commendably, to live in the labyrinth of Tudor politics and in the midst of that, not withdrawing from it like the separatists, but the commitment to it, trying to find a way out, the, a way of living out the gospel and supporting others that did, even when it, in fact it put his life at risk. You know, there's this story of, you know, Cranmer really got his reformed ideas from the continental reformers in Germany, Lutheran specifically. And he, as what he began to do was arrange this kind of back channel immigration process to bring some of those German Lutherans into England to become, in fact, a part of his council to support them in the midst of times of real persecution. And I know that story because actually that describes my forebears. Uh, Brewer used to be to not spell English, B-R-E-U-E-R, -E -E because they originated from Germany and came over to England, as far as we can tell, back in the time of Cranmer. Now, standing as he did, with Latimer and Ridley, regretting so deeply about his own inability to confess the face in the face of the flames, as you know, finally led Cranmer to be able to say the famous quote, burn this hand first, when he was finally convicted of heresy, having been degraded of the position of archbishop because you couldn't burn an archbishop. Uh, that was against church law. You could only burn lay people. <laughs> and so he had to first have be stripped of all of his offices and then stood for trial and then finally condemned. And then, of course, the quote, burn this hand first because this is the hand that signed the recantation which he stood and regretted. And out of that was, in fact, burden of the state. He was not, he understood, in other words, the nature of sacrifice. But he was willing to do that. Lord, let us now thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. You know, the New Timidus really does describe some of the heart of uh, Cranmer's theology because he knew there was open for him the gate of eternal life. And therefore, because by the death and resurrection of Jesus, he was, in fact, acceptable in the sight of God. Redeemed sinner that he was. It is not by accident that Welby is being enthroned today commemorating the martyrdom of Thomas Cranmer. Uh, I would, because in some ways, some of the things that marked Cranmer's life are also characteristics of the new Archbishop of Canterbury, including a kind of revolution in worship. Do you know there are more contemporary praise choruses that are going to be included in the enthronement service today than there has ever been in the history of any enthronement? There is more international music in the service today than there has ever been in any other enthronement. And oh, Justin Welby coming out of a conversion experience through the Alpha Course of Holy Trinity Brompton Church in downtown London is someone for whom an evangelical posture in regarding the scriptures and in regarding to the faith is home base. That's where he lands. Even though, like Cranmer, He's willing to live in the midst of the labyrinth that is our Anglican communion in these days and trying to find a way to live that out and build bridges with people to see that we might grow in our commitment to unity in the midst of our differences. All of that I find extraordinarily commendable. So, let me stop. I can go home and I don't want to. What does this have to say to us? I would want to say to you that that commitment to Scripture to a, 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 a religion of the heart and a willingness to sacrifice not only marks the best of Anglicanism, but it really should mark the best of the Diocese of Central Florida. It's us. I think at our best. 
a willingness to be able to say, we will not require of anyone anything that cannot be directly proven by Scripture. We are willing to live in those places where we agree to disagree because the Scripture does not speak definitively. And we will commend the faith that is in us without shame or embarrassment. We will talk about a passionate life of the heart, knowing that we understand that we are accepted in the sight of God as redeemed sinners. And that we will be willing to make the sacrifices necessary as publicly commending the gospel, even in the face of opposition, as people who are willing to give of their time and of their treasures sacrificially to see the kingdom extended and to make common cause with those who may or may not be like us because the goal is the extension of the kingdom, not the theologically proving of our own right doctrine. That gets into a level of I need to be right to get accepted in a way that I'm not sure rings true to Anglicanism. So, in, with that, let's not just give thanks for Cranmer and pray for Justin, although let's certainly do both of those. But let's commit ourselves to say, God, in this stream of the Christian faith to which we have been received, baptized, and confirmed, may we live it out at its best here joining and taking our place with those who do the same all across this planet for the sake of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Amen.